we forgot to have him do the intro again, Tyler. Ah, uh, that's all right. It's happens. not all right. We gotta get it. happens. <laughs> we gotta get into the habit. Well, to, this week we have Jonathan Beer with the traditional B E E R spelling, and we were supposed to have him do the intro, and we forgot again. We need again. to have some. We need like a producer to be we, sitting here. We really need to get of, in the swing of these things. Yeah, we've been doing it for a little while now. Uh, we keep switching it up. That's the problem. Yeah, very true. Um, his company is called John Beer Contracting. He um, grew up in Albany, which is not quite upstate New York. I guess it, it would be considered, but um, maybe like two hours north of New York City. Um, and then he went to school in New York City, lived in New York City for a couple of years, studied art. Got his master's in art, did a little art teaching, and it just wasn't working out. He he couldn't find steady work doing that. So he landed on, um, well, I guess fate kind of brought him into this by buying a fixer-upper multifamily. Very true. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then just like tinkering and one thing led to another and he didn't have work and was like, well, I'll start doing it for myself. One thing led to another. But before yeah. we get into all that, we talk about, uh, we get deep into the art side of it and painting. Uh, and then if you guys want to check his painting out, check out the description in the, well, below the, the show, and there'll be a link in there Have to do that. Welcome to the podcast, John. <laughs> Whoa, that was very loud. I gotta take my uh, shirt off now. So, I'm are you guys gonna say the duration molding and millwork thing? Well, no, I guess you're done. They're done, right? So, well, they're done, but we also do all the intros and stuff after. Uh, yeah, I think because we don't know what we're gonna talk about. We could, you know, as you you may know with us, we might go down like a rabbit hole. So, what's up, man? You you are what year five of owning a small business? Is yeah, right? yeah. Um, so, about two weeks ago was well, October seventeenth. Uh, is that was the date? Yeah. So yeah, how's it been? Um, it's been two more two more years till you start making money. I you know I heard you say that. <laughs> I listened to the last week's episode this morning, and uh, it's so funny because it kind of feels that way lately. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting for sure. Um, I don't know like if you guys know my background or anything at all. Um, give, give us the rundown. Pretend we yeah, do. Yes, so I'm 34. Um, I am not from a construction background at all. Um, I like my passion is art, in particular painting. So I went to school um, down in Manhattan. Uh, I got a bachelor's and a master's in painting. Um, what does that and, mean? Like, can you? Because uh, yeah. I know nothing about that side of it, and. I've, I'm always curious to understand how you are schooled in that. Like, what are you, what are you learning? So, um, like anything, it's uh, a mix of technique and, and like theory, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so in undergrad, um, you know, your first year is considered your foundation year, right? So you're doing like, it doesn't matter whatever major you declare, everyone is doing painting, drawing, um, art history, uh, photography, sculpture, um, and then like some kind of um, like writing or um, like humanities course. Um, so then like your second year, let's say like me, I started out in illustration. Then you start working on more specific uh, classes that are like tailored to your major. Um, and a lot of it is a lot of it is like actual like producing artwork um, and kind of like drilling down on certain skills and um, developing them more. And then, you know, with the idea that like by your fourth year, when you're getting into like a thesis level project that you, you know, have some sense of like what you like and maybe what you want to explore with your work. And um, so I started out in illustration. Um, as a kid, I wanted to love comic books and wanted to, to draw comics. It, um, is illustration a broad term or is that a very narrow focus? I'd say it's pretty, pretty broad. Um, you tend to see a lot of it as like 
editorial illustration. So like mm-hmm. stuff that's in like New York mm-hmm. Times or, you know, um, the New Yorker, you know, a lot of like periodical stuff. Um, but it, you know, there's a lot of bleed over between like people that are illustrators and graphic designers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I quickly realized like illustration wasn't really for me. And like, I wanted to like have more kind of philo- philosophical like thought as part of my work. And so painting became like the way to express that. Um, so my, towards my second year, I started painting more. I, um, like turned my apartment into a studio, um, and started working at home. And, um, yeah, the, by senior year, I had like developed a body of like a body of work with like kind of a cohesive, um, theme. They were all, um, like fairly surreal, um, paintings that all had to do with like imagining um, the kind of like architecture of the mind in a way Um, like I have a lot of interest in you know like neurology and philosophy and like I love the I I love taking like some of those concepts and like like giving them a visual kind of life Uh, this podcast brought to you by Rockwool um so I I was I was all right say yo 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 what's up um, you're pulling what? Uh, I was pulling out, I was putting in today a countertop. It's like an office built in that I'm doing. And the one wall is an exterior wall, regular insulation, that. And then the other wall is basically a partition wall that's separating the office space, where the goal was always to have a built in desk from the bathroom. And they had just used regular unfaced drywall in there i guess for noise control with the drains and water and all that and we're not demoing it it's not our scope but i was kind of bummed that i didn't see rock wool in there Wait, for unfaced fiberglass yeah you said drywall i was like, oh sorry <laughs> unfaced uh fiberglass yeah. um behind the drywall and i'm like i feel mm. like this isn't doing anything dude we so our renovation project in back bay um client lives out of state and they we had a meeting um this week they she flew in and i get on site the other the other day and i'm like uh i know the meeting is in five minutes where is everyone and walking around the job downstairs looking around I, there's an electrician down there working climb upstairs no one's on site i walk around the corner of the back room they're all standing there talking oh really and i'm like Whoa. I was like, I thought no one was in here. And she was like, I was just saying how quiet it is in, it is in here. And it was because everything's rock wool. Yeah. Floors, ceilings, walls, and they were tucked in the front study chatting away. And I'm like, all right, this is, this is crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, that's, we use it obviously for sound, but also, uh, on the exterior of our walls when we can. A lot of people were asking about if we were going to use it on the exterior of our Steve Teak build, and we're not, unfortunately. It wasn't detailed that way. Uh, but, of course, our Rhode Island Passive and then some other projects we have coming up. Actually, Doug's house that we're renovating, we're doing uh, exterior insulation on that, so you'll see a future site visit, and we'll talk more about those details. But uh, if they want to join, if they want to learn more, they got to join the R class program. You have you signed up? It. Have you signed up? Man, I don't need any more knives. <laughs> it's more than knives. It's all the technical uh, instructions, also, but a connection to their technical team to work through the details. So, if you guys want to sign up, head over to rockwell.com/slash R class. No, if you haven't, you should definitely do it. Um, like Nick said, it's going to give you access to a lot of information and people who are going to be able to answer or answer any questions that you have and point you in the right direction to ensure that your installations are kind of tightened up and buttoned up in the way that they're intended to be as per their spec. So definitely do it. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to botch this, right? But yeah. are you are you saying that you're like a painting is almost like a... Uh, um, a, a, a visual of like the neuroceptors in my brain oh well i mean a hundred percent like that's would be definitely a way to describe it um, okay 
uh, whether I don't even you, know what a neuroceptor looks like. I just was like, like I, I know this new term. <laughs> whether you're like whether you're expressing like whether the painting is expressing your idea, like it's also the painting is an, is a picture, but it's also like a it's also like a recording of your neural mm-hmm. impulse in a weird way. Like you could okay. draw a philosophical parallel to that too. When you say it was cohesive, so I have so many questions about painting because yeah. I find it so super interesting. Um, when you say it was cohesive, was that something that you went into, like you make your, your, your turn your room into your studio? Mm. Did you say, I'm going to, I have to be cohesive with piece after piece or did that just naturally develop? Uh, it kind of developed on its own. Um, I, I mean, I can show you like some images of what their, what that early work looked like. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, it would be awesome to see. We don't have to do it right the okay, second. Yeah, but. so it it will help give you some context. I'll send you some images. Okay. But yeah, so like I would develop one idea. Like, um, so here's a good example. So I made a couple paintings based off of um, this sort of neurological idea that when you go to sleep at night and you're dreaming, um, all of the short term memory that you've like laid down during the day, uh, kind of detaches itself and reorganizes itself into long term into longer term memory and so like that idea that like at night things came apart um to be put back together was like it's a very visual like interesting Mm -hmm. visual uh kind of concept so i had done a couple of paintings of like these cities at night where they've like totally like released themselves from the ground and the roads are like up in the air and like tangled and kind of coming apart um, and so like the work was about a lot of things like that. Uh, what I, so <laughs> what was your end goal with painting? That's what always, no, so. no end goal. This is, I, I'm, so I listened to the episode where you talk about art a lot, Nick, the, la- the latest one. And I'm yeah. like, so interested to, to like get into want, the, this a little bit. Let's beat the hell out of this conversation. I mean, I mean it cause I think it's yeah. super interesting. I want to, I, I, as you said, as you started describing that painting, I, I'm trying to figure out how to politely ask this, but like when you describe it, I can, I'm only imagining people listening to this. Oh, that guy's on drugs. He's on acid. Like he, he's tripping and he's just like painting in his mind. But, and, and I, with, I'm not going to ask you if you're on drugs necessarily. No, but, no, definitely. It, I mean, nothing's off the table either. Like, um, like, but is that like, is that, I, I guess the, Listen, I didn't do drugs growing up. Like I just, it never was of interest to me. Same. But what was always an interest was the fact that like people had this opportunity to explore the part of imagination that I never will. And and when you're explaining like these these short term thoughts or memories throughout the day, that when you go to sleep they all reorganize themselves and you wake up and like stuffs in like that's that's wild to imagine. Yeah. And it's so, you know, you, I, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure how to feel about it. It's just, it's just super interesting. And then to take that to a level where it's like, hey, that's not only a thought in my mind, but I'm going to actually paint it. Yeah. And then when someone looks at it, they can, you know, decipher it any way they want. But then they turn to you and say, what, John, walk me through this. And you're like, oh, well, this is your, these are your short term memories. And when you go to sleep, they're reor- like you, someone could look at you and be like, dude, you're, you're tapped. <laughs> like you're you're way out there but it's but it's but it but that's what is so amazing about art is yeah because like you know that there's no it doesn't have to be truth it doesn't have to be fiction it does it, it's strictly just like a expression thought. yeah, yeah it's expression, just pure yeah. pure expression yeah um so like like i got there like i was interested in reading about this stuff and like i'd read read that I remember reading that and be like being like wow, this is like incredible that our brains do that. And that we also know that about the brain, right? Um, so, okay, so you you studied that and found that we stu- actually, like studied. our brain, yeah, yeah, you read it and you realize that our brain actually does this like organization of, of thoughts when we go to sleep. And yeah. you took that to a visual. Right. And this was like pre, pre-inception. So like everyone got a sense of like, like, how everyone got a good idea of like how I thought about these things once the movie Inception came out. And like, Mm. you know, when like 
the the like world starts Never to like sorry. fold together. Uh, there's a lot of visual stuff in that movie that for me I was like, oh man, this is really close to like how I'm thinking about some of these things. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that was like my first body of work was like all based around those ideas um, about how our brain works and you know if you imagined that as a landscape, what it would look like. Did you did you ever show your work? Yeah, I still do. Do you still paint? Um, yeah, yeah. I have a studio um, in my basement. Um, and uh, I'm actually building um, my first ever ground up build is my new shop and studio. Um, and it'll be the first painting studio I have that's above ground, which is really exciting. That's going to be a whole new <laughs> world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a 30 by 50 building, so it'll be pretty big. Oh, that's big, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 14 foot ceilings. Um, yeah. So what about from the business perspective? You went into this because you were interested in art. You end up in this painting world mm -hmm. and expressing through paint. Is Was there ever a thought of making it a business? Oh, sure. I mean, you're sort of groomed, you know, you're groomed for that in art school now. It's very like, art schools are really a big business funnel. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so illustration is very commercial from the outset, right? So it's like all about working for for clients. Um, you know, um, the like plastic arts, painting, sculpture, photography, whatever, you know, video. Um, your, your main avenue towards uh, income is like through a gallery is really like most common, the common way now. Um, so typically the the arrangement is like, like I have a gallery I work with down in Southampton. Um, so he, uh, we put a solo show on together like once every two years. He includes my work in group shows. Um, he sells directly from the gallery uh, to his clients um, and market does marketing and all this stuff. And uh, in exchange, when he sells a painting, he takes a 50% commission. So uh, that's like the kind of main avenue for sales uh, in the art in the art world or in, in 2d art um and then like in school you know depending on where you go you probably take a handful of courses that have to do with like writing a contract and like social networking and marketing yourself and how to make a resume because there's all these other aspects in the art world that require some of that stuff um there are residencies where you know, let's say you, um, let's say you work with like textiles and you, um, want to, you want to go somewhere where there's like a rich history of textile making and you find like an art institution that offers a residency. So you would like basically write an artist statement and say like, this is why I think this place is important to my work. I want to come here and like, like learn about it and make some work. Um, on site and you know the better residencies have a stipend and so like you either get paid for um, your time to be there they provide you a studio sometimes both so there's other aspects to the art world that involve some of the business side of things um, teaching also is part of that um, but yeah so I have some like I got a lot of intro to business stuff through art sure. school too is it still a common um, thought that, you know, some of the best art artists never make any money and they make all their money when they die? Like, is that still – like, I think, Tyler, you had said on the last podcast, you know, it's like th these guys make no money until, they're, you know, they die yeah. and then they become someone. Is that um, still a, a, a common thought in the art world? Uh, I think the more common thought on our side of things is that most of us won't make it. Um, but why? Because you won't make money. Well, because yeah, because you won't you won't make it in the sense of you won't make it to like all the hurdles of um, finding a gallery um, to represent you, and then a gallery that will promote you, and a gallery that will help you find clients and be able to like provide you with financial security. If that's mm excuse me, if that's how you view making it, right? 
Um, just it's just a, a numbers game in the sense that like art schools are pumping out you know tons of graduates every year, and there's only so many galleries, and there's only so many collectors. Um, so many many artists have to find other means to support themselves. Um, and you know, I think there's some discussion among like our community, you know, about the people, you know, there are a handful of them that are like, you know, 24, 25 that like are in the right place in the right time. And they hit it with a gallerist and the gallerist has a client that loves their work and they blow up, you yeah. know, people that are right out of art school, selling out shows, $50,000 per painting, you know, like that's like a once in a lifetime thing. Um, hasn't, hasn't social media changed this? Oh yeah, just turned it up to eleven. Right, I, I've mentioned him before on the podcast. I, I think his name's Caleb Schaub, and he does these paintings where he's got a studio with a bicycle chain that spins his canvas around. <laughs> yeah. He usually paints the whole canvas white or or black, and then he mixes these paint, and it has this like rainbow effect. Right, and it it basically spins, and he does it very intentionally. It makes a huge mess, mm -hmm. but they're beautiful. And then he, you know, he he's um, I've followed him for a long time and he went into a pretty dark place because everyone was like, this is an art, you're, you're fake, like all the, the traditional sure. hate, right? Yeah. And he kind of went quiet for a while and he came back and I remember when he came back, he was just like, he'd finish the painting, he'd post the final thing and he'd be like $50,000 and it would sell. Yeah. And I was, and, and that was really where my, 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 my thought started really growing with art and the perceived value of it. And think that's why I asked the question about like business and everything where, you know, I guess we can relate it to building in any business really that there's going to be the exceptions. There's going to be the guy that goes on uh, Instagram and promotes his artwork and, and blows up. But then there's a hundred other thousand, hundred thousand other painters that are doing something similar or trying and they're just not there yet. Yeah. And it's, and it and it's a grind and it would be, you know, it, it, for me, it's you know I, I'm I'm looking directly at the guy that made it, right? Right. Thinking like he he's he's decided that his paintings are worth fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, and there's a client for that. But it's there's a client for your paintings at six figures. But in order to get access to that client, that's the difficult part. Is is what we're getting to? Yeah, I mean it may never happen. Right. Um, which which in a sense is is good too for the art itself i think um mm -hmm. so like when i'm when i left the city and moved up to newburgh um in 2014 um i took a break from painting um for a long time i was a really firm believer that like you had to be in the studio every day like to have a strong studio practice and like otherwise you know you weren't thinking about it all the time and and when I moved up here, um, and I, I left the city and bought um, a Victorian with my best friend, uh, 6,000 square feet, and the idea was we were going to become landlords and have this like, l like passive income and a and a uh, and a way to like have more time to make art. Um, and so I moved up here and started working on the house, and um, it it forced me into a place where like I didn't have a studio, like the basement was disgusting. You know, we hadn't done anything down there yet. And, um, so I took a break for like a year and it was so refreshing. Um, mm. a, because I was like physically separated from the, like the, the actual art world itself, galleries, you know, the whole like, crowd and and that was really healthy because it made me think a lot about like what who am I doing this for yeah. um, and it's easy you know there's that like meme about um, being a contractor right where like you start the day feeling like amazing like you're having the best day ever and then one thing happens and like you're like I'm a piece of shit and then like it goes back up so the studio is really similar um, so I set this kind of loose rule for myself that if I was going to spend time in the studio, I wanted to enjoy doing it, whether whether something good, whether a good painting came out of it or not, or 
you know, um, whatever. Like I just wanted to make sure it was a place where I was always enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that until I separated myself from like that consumerist side of the art world. Um, it's, I think it's so hard to produce um, unique art if you're trying so hard to do so. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, like if if your intent is to be able to produce a certain amount of paintings or I have to be here to create this this volume of art, I think that that takes away from the art itself. Um, there are those people who just constantly put out stuff that seems to be mind-blowing and very unique and it's like like what is what's the secret formula that this person has that they continually push the bounds or it's like how do you come up with this shit anymore yeah um but i think for most people like having the pressure of having to produce art is kind of contradicts the the entire notion of art itself yeah i think so i mean you think about the history of art right um people have been making things with their hands visually like in the, in the search, uh, for like pure expression for a long time, but it's only the last hundred years that we've had like a public facing, you know, books and, and magazines and like the internet and social media where that has a totally different stage. Um, and I don't, I don't know that it's possible to like, totally take yourself out of that context and like think about it in a way in a, in a way that doesn't involve those things um yeah it can definitely be hard to like get out of your own way a little bit are most galleries looking for art that's kind of marketable um or when it comes to fine art something that like has the right technique and um like layout for it uh you know are they looking to make money by by finding somebody where it's like hey this is very this is sellable we'll be able to there'll be buyers for this or are they looking for somebody who's like hey this person just has what it takes you know they're formally trained they know exactly what they're doing and so we want to bring this in kind of le to legitimize the art world i think there's both really um pr and probably like a pretty big scale um there are definitely some galleries that are more like we would call them like more commercial. Like they just want to like have a solid stable of artists that they know they can sell, move work with and like people like it and that's okay. I mean, they are businesses at the end of the day too. Um, there are definitely galleries that have more, um, put more emphasis on like what kind of programming that they put together. Um, you know, some are like very painting oriented. Some are very, video or performance art oriented. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to the Dia Beacon um, up near where I am, but the Dia Foundation is dedicated to just showcasing, showcasing minimalist art. So like it's a whole museum and foundation that just is about minimalism. Um, so, every, you know, there's a whole run of the gamut. Um, I'm really fortunate to work with someone uh, who like saw something in my work and he shows a wide variety of, of different artists. Um, but I think they're all people that have like a pretty like solid chunk of themselves in their work. Um, like they feel pretty authentic and interesting and they have a perspective. And so like, I'm, you know, the, the guy that I work with, um, down in Southampton is great. And like, I think he has a vision for his own space, but everyone's different. Yeah, so there, there's like the saying that no uh, idea is unique. You know, nobody came up with any single idea. Um, and I think that as artists and people just kind of coming out of school or just taking those first steps in their journey in the art world, a lot of times they're trying to follow these rules, right? And they're they're seeing what other people do and they're looking to mimic that. And it's like this very clean like safe artwork yeah. <clears throat> um and it's really cool to see somebody go from that to growing and having enough confidence within their art to kind of loosen up and not walk that tight line um 
and not necessarily follow the rules like yeah there's certain things that you should be doing but now it's like all right now you have your own flair and your own style where it's not just like oh you took this from this person this from this person and it's like you can see that through there um and i think of it a lot with tattooers where it's like early in their career they want to produce like perfect tattoos and as they kind of grow in their career and realize hey i can it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's art. It's not meant to be perfect. It can have some personality. It can have, um, some imperfections in there and loosen up a little. And it's not so rigid. And like, to me, that's kind of when you can see that person's style and what, you know, they, they can contribute to the art world. Um, which is, I guess coming out of art school, like it would be really hard to, to try and find a career based um, on like formal training that you had in art world when art is not supposed to be that formal. Yeah. Um, that you know, puts it, like that puts it together pretty well. <laughs> it like, I, I'm just thinking about like your career path and what you intended to do and art school to me, I, I understand being like a graphic designer. Right. And like there's certain there's certain things that you have to do, but like when you're looking to get into the fine art world, um, it's like, is there a formula that these people are teaching you and how much money are you paying for that when you need to come out on your own and kind of learn all of this anyway? Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head in the, in the sense of like the kind of questions that you come out of school having. So like I moved up here and I had done four years in undergrad two years in grad school and a year fellowship after grad school. And, uh, you know, taking that year break and coming back to painting, I really was like, was going to school for this worth it? Like, what, what did I get out of this? Um, and like, I don't mean that in a, in a, as a statement, but a question. Um, Mm -hmm. and I got, did get a lot out of it and I think it was great. Um, but there was certainly a lot of unlearning that had to happen. Um, you know, from, uh, like, like being in the studio and having my old professor's voices in my head, um, you know, like you have critiques, right. In art school where, you know, you're working towards some assignment, you're making a piece for it. And then you meet and everyone like presents their work and like we critique each other's work and the professor joins in on that. Um, and sometimes like that could be really hard, um, at which, most of the time the hard crits were the good ones um, because you left with this new perspective about something that you made um, that took something inside you to make uh, and now you had to like go deal with that. Um, and are, are those critiques more of like um, a technical critique or more so no, from the, the like both, concept? Both for sure. Um, yeah, that's insane. Like, I just think it, it takes a different part. Like, it's it's one thing to critique technique. Like, okay, this is incorrect or this shouldn't be shaded this way. Or, hey, this background, you know, is overwhelming to the fo- whatever it may be. But, like, to be able to be in tune conceptually with art and what that person's looking to convey and then be able to con- critique it kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, you know participating like as the person who's showing your work you have to come to it with like a certain amount of vulnerability um and not everyone was comfortable with that i think you know some people were a lot less willing to talk about what their work was specifically about um on an maybe on an individual like uh, basis like each work of art um but you know i mean I had a professor who said to me once, I'll never forget it. He's like, I can hear you thinking in your painting. I'm like mm-hmm. that was really hard to hear. Um, yeah. And it took like, it's taken years to, for me to not get over it, but to like understand what he meant and not think when I work and like feel more. And, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it was a, crazy interesting experience um and i i think a lot of you know what what that professor saying there is applicable to many different things in life 
Um, and I think that comes down to experience and, and kind of confidence in your ability and not trying to overanalyze and perfect what you're doing and like having some sort of metric for every single move that you make where it's like, Hey, I can just kind of roll with this and make this work and how it turns out is going to be how it turns out. And like, you know, that, that definitely transcends art, um, kind of, you know, the bigger picture life and everything else where it's like, you don't have to have everything planned out and you don't have, it doesn't have, you don't have to start at a and get to Z on the quickest line possible. Um, with the least amount of mistakes along the way. Yeah. And like it, it's, that's what it's really cool if you find like a newly blossoming artist and you kind of are intrigued with their artwork and you watch them come into their own, like I was saying before, because like you like their style and you like what they're doing and then you follow them along and that journey, they change so much because like what they were when they first started is not necessarily who they are. Like it's, it's everything that everyone told them to do and everything that they saw everyone else do. And then once they like progress in their career, they kind of find their stride and they have enough self-esteem and confidence in their own little world where it's like, Hey, I can do this because I like this. And maybe it's not right. Maybe it's not wrong, but like, this is what I want to do. And it's really cool to be able to witness that growth of whether it's an artist, um, you know, a musician, um, there, there's a ton of different medium that you can kind of witness that self growth, which is really interesting. Yeah. I think there's, um, a lot to be said for like learning to let yourself off the hook, like whatever it is you're doing, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Getting out of your own way. And, um, I was talking to someone about being on the podcast this morning and I was like, I'm, you know, I'm nervous and they're like, uh, they're like, you know, just be yourself. And it made me think of this Bob best Dylan. advice ever, right? Yeah. <laughs> they made me think of That's this. That's Bob... nervous about. <laughs> yeah. About this Bob Dylan quote, right? That, uh, he says, um, Oh God, I'm going to botch it now. Um, all I can do is be me, whoever that is. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's, uh, it's a good one. It's, yeah, I mean, it's so simple, but at the end of the day, like, it's not simple at all because someone's like, just be you, and you realize that you were made up of so many different people and experiences that, like, who the hell are you? Like, you're just this this mashup of all the people who you've come into, you know, that have walked in and out of your life and all those experiences, and, like, that is truly you but it's almost like not you at all. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's art it's, right there. It, it's funny. Like even some of the set, I've noticed it recently, like certain things I say, it's like you pick it up from someone else. It's yeah. Like, oh, you know, for, for, I don't even, I actually don't know where this came from, but <laughs> we were away a couple weeks ago and somehow every time someone asked a question, rather than saying no or no, it was negative. <laughs> and it just stuck with, it it's, has stuck with me. And every time someone asks, I'm just no, negative. And I'm like, why am I saying? And it's like you say, Tyler, it's like this mashup of just who I'm around, who you're with, what you're consuming, and you're like evolving into a, a, the version of your current self. Yeah. It's like Which when I said cheers on the like... podcast like last year, and you're like, oh, what, you stole that? I'm like, no, everyone keeps saying cheers to me, so I'm saying cheers yeah. back. <laughs> Which like you, it's probably why so many – artists end up isolating themselves and like <laughs> you know they're like i don't want any input like i yeah. want to dig deep and see who i really am and what's inside of me without kind of the the rest of the world influencing those thoughts yeah just leave me alone so i can cut my ear off yeah man <laughs> <laughs> so are your parents artists uh no n- not really um i mean the yeah, the short answer is no. Uh, my dad is a retired um, ophthalmologist, uh, uh, an eye surgeon, um, and he was like, he's artistically inclined for sure. Um, he, I remember growing up, he told me he either wanted to be a sculptor, um, a physicist, or a doctor. Um, so the, doc- Very, the doctor thing yeah. worked out. 
uh, and my mom uh, was a nurse. Um, so my my grandma on both sides though are painters. So mm. it it's, goes back, I think, to them. So what did your parents have to say when you kind of decided to go that route? Uh, 100% supportive. <clears throat> I'm super lucky to be able to say that. But yeah, it was like yeah. no question, you know. And it was no question for me that that was what I wanted to do. Um, it was more of like, uh, okay, what's, like, what's it going to look like, you know, in four or five years? See, that's what sucks so much about it, though, because, like, you're going to college, right? You're it, at at some level, if not majority of that level, you're looking for what that return's going to be. Like, what are you going to do when you're done college? What what type of career can you make out of this? And when you're looking to kind of go down the artistic road, like those are the wrong questions to be asking. Um, yeah, which makes it it makes it really difficult because like you're looking to go into a career where you want self-expression and you want to dig deep and, and philosophically find out what all of this means. And in the background, you're like, well, I also have to make a career out of this. Like I have to make money, which is really tough. I, um, I wanted to teach, which was, um, which was like what my trajectory was after school. Um, I really wanted to teach college, uh, like art at the college level. And I started to actually in, in Jersey. Um, I taught, uh, at Montclair state. Why did you want to teach? Um, I mean, I think, well, I mean, I know the, the teachers that I had in undergrad and in, in grad school that like got me into something, whether it was like philosophy or painting or, you know, drawing or whatever, that, um, spark, uh, was so powerful and like such an incredible thing. And I wanted to be able to give that back. Um, cause like, it's really like them passing on their passion about something. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that was like, it felt really impactful. Um, and like, I enjoyed the interaction with people. Um, and so it was kind of a natural, like, okay, let's like see if this will work. Um, so was your grad school education oriented or art oriented? Uh, art oriented. So what did you have to do to be able to teach college level art afterwards uh so i got connected to the head of the painting department um by a former professor and uh, i mean basically i had to come up with like a lesson plan and kind of trajectory for the semester i mean i was teaching painting one right which is like basic first painting class first painting course that you would be required to take whether you're an art major or whether you're a nursing student that needs humanities credits. Um, so I just had to put those together. You know, we had a couple of people from my um, graduating class that were also brought on as adjuncts in the same department. So we kind of collaborated on like, maybe we try this, you know, maybe we show them this. Um, so it was like, a, it was a formal like lesson plan and a curriculum essentially and sort of like, how are we going to, what were our goals for the semester? You know, um, what were our, like, what were we trying to get students to be able to complete, like, you know, paint, like painting a still life in perspective and understanding concepts of like light and dark and, you know, color temperature and stuff like that. So it was, you know, there was some planning and stuff. And how long did you do that for? So I ended up only teaching for a semester. Um, I so you know in school you have like a registration book where you can like pick your classes um so because of some kind of clerical error my class ended up being in the very back of the book none of my students saw it so my class didn't fill and like suddenly I didn't have another I didn't have like another semester class waiting for me so there was like nothing my department had could really do about that so it was like a kind of exciting like start yeah. and then uh you know, depressing like quick 
And so it wasn't it wasn't like the hey I tried this and it just turned out not to be what I wanted so yeah. I went a different path. It was you a, enjoyed it though. I loved it. Um, it was hard. I mean, it was really way harder than I thought it was going to be. So um, why not try somewhere else? Or I like, did. Yeah. I I applied to every teaching program in a hundred mile radius of New York City. Wow. Uh, after that, um, and didn't get a single call back. How come? Um, some cases probably was experience. Um, most schools want, and this is so ridiculous, five years of teaching experience after you get your MFA. Um, which is like, how are you supposed to get that if you don't hire people that are fresh out yeah. of grad school? And then I think the arrest was just, they're all inundated with applications. Yeah. Um, and the people that have some kind of connection like I had at Montclair will probably go first. Yeah, I mean, that gets rid of and kind of sorts out that five-year experience thing. Mm -hmm. Like, when it's somebody you know, mm -hmm. they make an exception to that. Because realistically, like, otherwise, there's no entry-level positions. Right. And, yeah, and, like, there's zero job security if you're starting out at that level. You're an adjunct, like, no, you know, benefits, no job security, you know, Previously, I think in academia, you could maybe hope for tenure one day, but now like a tenured, when a tenured professor retires, a lot of schools retire the tenure. So like there's no chance of you getting like a kind of a pension or anything like that after staying for a certain number of years. So Did you end up having any of those experiences that you kind of found so valuable with your own professors with any of your students? Yeah. Uh, like yeah. a handful of them were so my class was mostly um, like business um, finance some nursing students and like two or three actual art art students yeah um, and the art students were good because they were like more a little more self-sufficient like they kind of got it they had developed more of a skill set um, but like you know teaching a teaching a student at like 18 who had never picked up a paintbrush before and showing them how to take like a still life that's sitting in front of them and put that in, create an image of that in three dimensions, three with three dimensional space on their canvas, like blew their mind. Um, yeah. You know, I, what Nick, did you ever take any interesting me? I remember when I was out at CU Boulder, I like, I don't even know how or why. I guess I needed a credit and schedule-wise it. I ended up taking like an intro to theater class. Um, <laughs> and I thought it was going to be like super easy. And I remember I went in and bombed the first test. Because mm -hmm. I was like, how hard is this going to be? And then it's just my mind doesn't work in that way. So it's one of those classes where I had to like try really hard because it be didn't come naturally to me. And I was so bummed because I thought it was going to just be like a cakewalk. Um, and it was not at all. <laughs> I, so I what did you either. learn in that? Yeah. I don't even remember, to be honest. Like, I was a science major. So I had so many science courses that were like heavily math-based and like very uh, polarizingly like yes or no. There was There was no gray area. And I just remember in that class like just struggling to conceptually understand everything that was going on because in in my academic career I always was successful because there was like a right and a wrong answer um and I didn't have to hypothesize or you know like reason it was like this is right this is wrong so I could memorize formulas like I can make sense of the math and the science and that's just kind of the way my brain operates. But then when you put me in this class where it's not graded that way, I was just like, I was a fish out of water. I was very uncomfortable. <laughs> How about you, Nick? I don't remember what I learned at all. I didn't take very many interesting ones. I, I, I feel like I skated through college in the sense that I just took what I needed. I, I, I've told this before, but in my entire college career, like I didn't write, I wrote one paper ever and it just was like none of my classes required it and i had a, there was one paper i had to write and it was like a breeze because it was something i had like i knew 
uh, like I knew a lot about, but I did take an intro to public speaking because I knew I sucked at public speaking <laughs> and I wanted to be better at it. Um, which I mean, now that I podcast and I do public speak, I, I don't know if I can relate, uh, the ability to, to that course. Cause every time I get up there, I feel like I'm going to shit my pants. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was, there was one class that was, I, I remember taking it cause it, and I needed a filler. I, but I just have no idea what it was because I left the first day. <laughs> I, I sat down, I listened to this guy talk, and I was like, I don't understand a single thing he said. And he was also kind of arrogant, so I just got up and I and I had left. Probably and an I, art class. It wasn't art. I <laughs> I want to say it was like economics or something. Uh, or like something, I, I want to say it was something in finance. Um, but I just remember him just being so arrogant. And at the end of the class, I asked him to sign. We had these like slips to like leave a class. All right. And he goes, why am I signing this? I'm like, because I'm not interested in your class. <laughs> and he's like, fair enough. See you later. Um, yeah, I don't know. The the, I, I wish I had spent more time in art. Everything, it, school for me was always so calculated. Mm. It, like every class I took was calculated with the understanding like, that I wanted to build. I wanted to be a carpenter and looking back, you know, I'm not going to like, I don't regret going to school or college or anything like that, but I've asked the same question where it's like, did this really help me get to where I am today? Um, and the education itself, maybe not, but the path in which that education took me. Yes. Obviously I can directly relate to where I ended up, but you know, if I were to do it again, I think I would have spent more time, exploring other things and not just being not being so rigid i mean i was rigid about being a carpenter since i was in elementary school it was just always what i wanted to do and i mean look i mean i'm not even a carpenter anymore at all like i haven't picked up a hammer and according to the youtube comments i think ever but (laughs) (laughs) but it's just i don't know i guess my That's why I'm so interested in art. So let me, uh, the other side of the art, I did do, I I did a lot of um, extracurricular art schooling, like outside of regular school. So I was in an art program from the time I was in elementary school all the way through probably high school. Mm. And it wasn't anything beyond, it was really just like, you know, from like five o'clock till seven o'clock at night you know, they would teach you how to draw or color pencil or paint. Like, and then you just, whatever you want to do, you want to do pencil, you do pencil. You want to do pen and ink, you can do pen and ink. And, but I just always loved drawing. Um, I always really wanted to paint. Um, and I had pulled out a couple canvases and, and tried to paint, but it was, I could never finish it. Where pencil and pen and ink, that was always something I would just keep going and and i would and i would always finish it and i don't know why i ever stopped doing it but every once in a while you know i i'm sitting here thinking about the other night we were doing i was doing watercolors with my kids and uh (laughs) i literally put my kids to bed and i came back downstairs and i poured a glass of wine and i finished it and i mean it's like it's like a troll like uh, like a picture of a troll (laughs) tree But it's like, you know, and it's line drawing, like out of a coloring book. And I sat there and I finished it. And and my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is like this. I'm in I'm in the zone right now. And she's like, you you're she took a picture of it. I'm like, I hope you show all your friends that that's that that looks cool. That's awesome. (laughs) But it but it but it reminded me like in that moment, I was like, I used to really appreciate it. it was it's one of those things. Tyler, you've asked the question before. It's like, you know, what hobby have you been able to do? Like dirt biking is for you, right? And, you know, years ago, like when John was on the podcast, he asked, like, what hobbies do you have? And everything is so work. So everything is so calculated. Everything is so, how do I move my life forward? How do I make more money? How do I buy a bigger house? How do I, like all of these things. 
And when I painted that watercolor picture, I'm going to have to take a picture of this. I hope I it's wanna, I want to see I it. Hope, I hope it's still on the fridge. <laughs> um I say it it was never on the fridge. I hope I I think it's sitting on top of the fridge. But in that moment, I realized this is the one thing I used to do where I would a- actually let go. And I wasn't thinking about work. I wasn't thinking about money, making like it, it was just trolls, trolls. <laughs> There's just troll trees. Just troll trees. Let me add, let me ask you this: Do you ever draw for clients? Like, especially no. now that you're thinking about like some of your projects that you've described, the way that you want to form spaces and have. So I'm I'm really bad at at space. Like, I can't do a floor plan. I'm not good at, like, that's just not my, even, like, the massing of the house is very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the detail, then I, that's my jam. I'll, I'll pull out my iPad and I'll sketch and sketch and sketch and, like, I'll work through, like, those minor details. And it's something that I've always thought about, you know, because I do like that part of it. I do like drawing. I do like designing. I like, I like working through those details. But the bigger picture is always really difficult for me. Where it's, you know, for example, like we're going to be renovating our house. I hired an architect to do the project. And when they put it on the paper, yeah, it all makes sense. Like, could I have figured it out? Maybe. But I would have struggled to really, like, understand what, you know, all those pieces together. But you give me that and then say, all right, now go work on the skylight detail. Yeah, I'll massage that until it's perfect. So it's when you ask, like, if I draw for clients, it's. I don't. Um, I I just don't. It's it's more so. It's more internal, and it's more for my team and and, and working through creative. Like I'm thinking about <clears throat> earlier. I w- walked through the cabinet shop, and Ian is uh, sanding these integrated uh, door handles. So it's MDF, and when you cut into that MDF, it's usually raw MDF. You glue it with this water glue mixture, seal up the MDF, and then you have to sand it. We've been doing a lot of these doors. And I said, you know, every time I walk by, I think of how much your fingers must hurt. And he goes, yeah. And like, you know, no shit. Like, you know, I've been doing this for like six months now. Like all we're doing is free. I'm like, and so that to me, like that right there. All right, let's, let's draw up a tool. Let's figure that out. Like, let's figure like, that's like the artist side of the artistic side of it. It's like, there's gotta be a solution and also a very practical one. Mm. Where it's like, what if we designed a sander that like fit into that and standardized the groove, and every groove is the same? So now you just need like this this disc that that goes in there. It's 150 grit, spins at a slow speed, and it's prepped for paint. He's like, yeah, yeah, that that would be cool. I'm like, let's do it. <laughs> you know, and and so it's like those little. It's when it's hyper focus is really interesting to me, and I think that's where you know going back to like the pen and ink. You know, I I drew this. I literally pulled this house out of a, you know, those books that you get for to like order blueprints for, for like yeah. $3,000. I ripped this house out of a picture of this house out of that magazine. And it was this like old stucco Tudor house. I loved it. I was like, I'm going to draw this. And I drew the whole thing and I drew, and they had this Oak tree in front and I drew every leaf, like every single leaf. And it ended up winning an award uh, when I was in like middle school, which you know, is super cool. But I rem- like I I liked that, and it was very slow and it was very detailed. But I, at, at, at the end of the day, like I knew, like once it was done, like you get to like pull back and realize all of those little things, you know, put together is this bigger thing. John, when you and um, you said that your friend ended up buying that Victorian, yeah, it's like your your kind of move after uh, your next move to have some passive income and take the next step. Um, when you were telling that story, I was in my head projecting, thinking, okay, so he bought this house and like renovated it and just fell in love with renovating Victorian homes. And that just like, that formed the trajectory of his career. And that was not, um, didn't seem like it was the case as the story progressed, but what, you know, what kind of got you moving in that direction? Was it that house at all? 
Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how it started. Um, so I had like basically zero experience um, before buying that house. Um, I was uh, scared to go into the wood shop in grad school. I think I went in once, maybe used the chop saw there once. Um, when I finished school and had my own studio, I bought a little Hitachi single bevel chop saw and a set of Makita drills. And I think I built one big wall in the studio. Um, you know, growing up, my dad put everything together with drywall screws. So we built this big ass wall on casters and put it all together, the studs all in with drywall screws and, you know, probably like the worst spackle job of my life. And uh, that was it. That was my experience, um, level of experience moving up here. Um, so I, I started looking um, with my friend. We were together at the time. We're now since separated and still best friends. Um, and we started looking in Newburgh in the middle of winter. We um, saw maybe 30 houses um, and eventually saw the one that, that we bought. Uh, it's 6,000 square feet, six units, Queen Anne style Victorian, built in 1890. Um, built as a single family residence that was split at some point in the 1920s, I'd guess. Um, and partially occupied. Um, one owner had had a lot of good repairs done to it. And um, so we made it happen. We moved in July, uh, the hottest day of the year, I remember. It was like 104. Um, we were super late getting out of the city and getting up here. Um, and by the time we arrived, the movers on this end had just disappeared. Um, we got here, started moving our stuff in. I remember going to sleep that night and, and laying down and feeling like the whole weight of the house on my chest and being like, what did I get myself into? I have no clue, you know, what to do. Um, and uh, so to like make it sort of a, a long story short, um, we ended up splitting up. Um, stayed best friends. We ended up buying another building together. We have a, um, 10 rental units together. Um, we're partners, uh, business partners, and um, we've renovated all the units, um, learned a ton along the way. I mean, when I say no experience, like I was filling nail holes and trim with spackle, like joint compound. Like yeah. it, it was bad. Um, I mean, it works, but go ahead. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, eventually I got to days. We used to fill them with uh toothpaste. Oh man. That's awful. You know, in the wall, you hang over the pictures in the dorm room and then you <laughs> fill all the holes at the end of the year. It works. You just can't sand it. Right. Right. Uh, as long as it's white toothpaste. Yeah. Right. Crest and, and, and like doesn't really do it. <laughs> uh, so eventually I, you know, I needed a job. Um, I needed money. Um, and there was a guy in town. Um, so Newburgh is not very big. It's about 30,000 people. Uh, a guy in town who also was an artist and was a carpenter. And I started working as his helper. Um, and specifically doing um, like historic restoration work. Um, so his specialty is our like sashes. Um, and so I did, worked with him on and off for about a year, I would say. Um, and he was just start like getting his business going in the area. He had recently moved here too. Um, and he wanted me to go full time. I couldn't commit to more than part time of having part time work with him and part time working on the rentals. So we ended up parting ways. And, uh, shortly after that, I needed money again and uh, decided to try it going on my own. Um, and like I, at that point, you know, my experience was related to like sash restoration. We had done a two story Victorian porch together um, and I had done, you know, our repairs on, on our, our buildings. Um, so I started off doing plaster, a lot of plaster repair um, and a lot of like basic trim, you know, 
my remember my first trim job was um, for a client who had all that like nice seventies wood fake wood paneling. Um, they had ripped it out of their their living room, which was like nineteen twenties, and it had a um, it had a flat stock uh, with a bead on it on the top. So that was the first job I learned how to cope uh, inside corners. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. Um, early on, like I was on Instagram and, uh, I didn't have a big, like, um, like people didn't know who I was. They didn't know what I was doing. So I used to go on, and this sounds crazy to think about. It's a total art school, like art world move. I went on Instagram and looked up the Newberg and like beacon hashtags, which are like, I live in Newburgh, Beacon is across the river. And I would go th- scroll through and find a post of someone oh, oh, sharing. Sorry, go ahead. Typically basic trim and Victorians are not going hand in hand. But um, why did you choose Newburgh before we go much further? Uh, Just out of curiosity. So I had heard about Newburgh from a gallery director friend. He was like, hey, we have this artist, Ryan. Um, he just bought a building in Newburgh. It's so big that he has a whole floor for painting and a whole floor for drawing and a whole floor for sculpture. And they're literally, I'm I'm quoting him, abandoned mansions laying on the side of the road. (laughs) So you were like sold. I was like, all right, let's start looking. And, uh, he wasn't wrong. Um, Newburgh in 2014 was very different than it is now. Uh, Sorry, that's my cat food feeder going off. Um, <laughs> Automatic cat food feeder? Amazing. Yeah. And uh, it's me saying, oi, like Roy Kent from Ted Lasso. <laughs> um, amazing. So, yeah. Um, so, like, for instance, if people are going to, like, think this is crazy. The 6,000 square foot Victorian we bought for 165K. Mm. Um, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a shell. Like it was, you know, three f- occupied rentals in it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the house that I did the first, you know, that first trim job in, um, was like a 1920s, like sort of craftsman y kind of house. Um, yeah. it was the first time I ordered a, a custom, like a trim ordered with a custom knife. Or not a custom knife. They already had, obviously, had a beaded flat stock knife. But, um, you know, I, it was like the first time working with that lumber yard, I remember, and like getting it milled. And, uh, it was awesome. You know, it was like solid poplar, you know, and like, I think I spent, I don't know, um, maybe three days trimming baseboard in two and a half rooms. Um, sounds like like, me. Yeah. And, and it was awesome. And like from there, um, oh yeah, I was saying like I started to cold, like I looked on it, was looking on Instagram, uh, looking at the Newburgh and Beacon hashtags. And, um, I find someone that was doing a renovation and send them a DM and say, Hey, like, you know, I'm a new carpenter. Like if you ever need any help, like on your job, like give me a message and maybe we can work together. Um, that, I and mean, you, that, that, people that's start a, reaching back out to you yeah yeah um, i feel like that takes huge balls especially when you're first starting out unless you were just like i really need money i mean i had nothing to lose um especially when you go into it saying hey i'm a new carpenter yeah i mean i wasn't after like anything like a big job that i couldn't handle yeah like i i knew i was interested in like trim was fun and like i would be like, yeah, you know, if you need help, like doing trim, I can like help you. I, I um, was th- I, I was thinking about specific to the Facebook groups the other day. We were talking about um, business generation, and and someone had mentioned Facebook groups, how they that's where all their business comes from. And I had asked, like, what do you, what do you mean? They're like, oh, I just join all the local groups, and I just post every once in a while, like, hey, this is what I offer if anyone needs it. It's like all my business comes from that. Mm-hmm. And you think about, you know. We're 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 flooded with stuff like on Instagram, and it's just that's just an algorithm feeding us stuff we like. But I'm in Facebook groups based on like where I live, 
And if someone said, you know, we constantly see it's like, hey, you know, school kid uh, out for the summer looking for some summer work. I'm like, dude, give that kid some work. Mm-hmm. Or it's like, you know, we have a place in New Hampshire. It's like, hey, guys, uh, I'm a fire fireman looking for some part time landscape work. I'm like, great. I have a yard. I need landscape. Yeah. And it's like direct. And, and I think if I was if, if I can, I guess my point is I can see why that worked where it's yeah like, hey. it was low 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 risk for both of us and like a low bar for entry mm-hmm. um and yeah you know it, it was like for every 10 or 20 messages i sent maybe i got like one back and i didn't need much you know yeah but um it was just to kind of get going um you don't yeah. happen. You don't happen to know the. Um, he's not alive anymore, but he was. But there was a guy named Tom Devita who lived in Newburgh, who was an artist. Do you? Name sounds familiar, but I didn't know him personally. Um. So he was a tattooer in New York City. Um, oh yeah. Like probably sixty, fifty, sixty years ago, and then he stopped tattooing. He moved to Newburgh. He was like by himself uh had a bunch of cats and stuff like that but i I know a lot of people would go visit him up there he got sick a couple years ago and died so Um, my newberg department head Mm -hmm. in illustration in undergrad was super tattooed like neck like every surface yeah and he would go see tom devito yeah Um, yeah he was uh i think he died maybe like two years ago or so He he was pretty old um, but I know he, he wasn't tattooing anymore, but he was definitely still creating art, mm. um, while like towards the end of his life. That was the only person I knew who lived in Newburgh. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to get that, ask that question. So you're, you're in the Facebook groups hunting down carpentry jobs kind of filling your time offsetting the income that you need at this time you're you're still on break from painting right yeah um yeah i think at that point uh we were like getting ready to you know fix the basement up and have studios down there um and so eventually some... found a guy that was like basically like the dude from the big lebowski uh on craigslist who like was a retired builder and came in and like totally lowballed the job like lowballed the price and like we let him frame out all the basement and sheet rocket for like three thousand dollars like something like absurd um <laughs> and I'll, he's like he's like all right i'll do it for three thousand but you got to help me move like the sheet rock and the studs down there i remember this it was like 80 sheets of sheetrock down the basement stairs and like 300 studs that were all frozen together in the middle of the winter, like throwing them in through the basement window. Um, but you know, it was like three grand. Yeah. Let's do it. How'd it turn out? Nice. Yeah. Fine. You know, he, it was the first time I'd ever seen sheetrock nails. Um, so like he was of the old school. Um, and you know what? Like there's not very many nail pops. Hey, that he certainly didn't glue it onto the studs. Mm. Um, but, Surprising, uh, especially since they were frozen when they went in. Yeah, I think his <laughs> schedule allowed them to, to thaw acclimate. out properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny because I, when I do drywall, I still typically use nails on the perimeter um, because no like, way. It, yeah, like on the perimeter because it holds the sheet up. Like a lot of times, I'm working by myself, it holds the sheet up better because um, it doesn't have a conical head. So like especially on ceilings and also like all the corners and seams are getting taped so you don't ever deal with nail pops. Um, but they typically hold the sheet to whatever substrate better than a screw because the screw can pull out much easier because, you know, the shape of the head. Yeah. Yeah, just like the shape of the head, the way that it goes into the drywall, it like is a you know, it's out, especially if you're hanging stuff overhead by yourself, like the flat head of the nail. Um, we'll just keep it up there and kind of hang off of that. But Interesting. I wouldn't post. use them on like the the center. You should post about that because I'd be curious <clears throat> of what I, I I would have never. I didn't even know that you could buy them anymore. Yeah, I mean they have two different types. They have like one that has 
smooth shank. It's a little bit longer, a bigger head on it. And then they have one that has like ridges, almost uh, like a, a, a ring shank on mm-hmm. there that has a smaller head. I like the ones with the bigger head again, because it's like I can put a board up by myself and put like two nails mm-hmm. and it'll hold it until I can go back and screw it. Yeah. Now, when you do that, do you wear the like single cloth apron and like just a hammer in your hammer loop on your pants? Like I just really keep it. I keep image? it in the room. I keep it in the room just to kind of bring back my roots, but I don't. <laughs> or you you wear the overalls and just like throw it in the back pocket. Yep. Um, <laughs> I also like. I mean, I don't do enough drywall to be very proficient with um like a drywall screw gun. Like a a lot of times they're just on remodels. You're working with older studs that those don't work on. Like they work fine on new construction, but a a few times I've tried using like the drywall screw gun. And when it's old stuff, it's more headache than it's worth. It's probably user error as well, but it's not like my screwing of drywall is that fast that I'm giving that much up when I'm like nailing corners off. Yeah. What about, what about, uh, do you guys ever use metal corner beads? Uh, like clips? Um, no, like corner bead for the drywall for the outside corners. Oh, yeah. Do they nail that or screw that? Um, it depends. Most people screw it when they do it. Um, yeah, a lot of people screw that too. I don't screw that because I feel like it leaves the the head of the screw so far out. Yeah. But I watch guys screw that, and I'm like, that would take me so long to screw, and I'd probably slip off and, like, mess the corner up 800 times. Yeah. See, in plaster, that just gets stapled. A couple yeah. Of yeah, staples. now they use, like, a trim, you know, often, like, a trim text corner and just the glue, spray it on, stick it on, and they're done. Yeah. A lot of times tape over it. Yeah. I'm old school, you know? <laughs> me, and, me and I probably know that guy. From your basement. <laughs> yeah, probably. Where were you getting the money from to pay for the renovations? Uh, well, we did as much as we could ourselves. Um, we would source as much as we could from, like, Habitat for Humanities. Like, we have a big restore in Newburgh mm. um, where they would have, like, recycled building materials. So we would try and get stuff there. Um, you know, my family, my parents still lived in Albany at the time, and so they, they would come help us. and you know both of them were are like barely handy and um uh but it was slow you know we had to really time the renovations um and a lot of time like if it was something big like for instance in the first year we replaced the water main you know i think it was like seven grand we paid for that out of our pockets like out of our savings Hmm. um and couldn't find one of them at restore no well yeah you could probably find the meter but not the excavator and all that um but uh you know when we bought the buildings um we did it with a family loan so um my we took a loan out basically like formed an llc my parents formed an llc they gave us a loan like you know standard loan with a, a amortization agreement and all that 30 years and we included uh, a chunk of money for the renovation. Um, of course, there was a point when we exceeded that or expenses were big and uh, we supplemented with stuff from our savings. Um, getting the house painted was an expensive one. Um, you know, new appliances add up pretty quickly. Um, mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. So you guys were occupying one unit and renting two or renting three? Uh, we were renting five. Oh, damn. Uh, and so when someone would move out, we would redo the apartment. Um, yeah. It was trial by fire. 3%. Um, yeah, that's the... a big, that's a big house to start on as well. Mm-hmm. Do you know, um, you said you're from Albany. Do you know Jeremy Castle? The name He's is really familiar. From... He like lives. One sec. He lives like outside of Albany. He's still up there. I just connected with a couple of people on Instagram from like my neighborhood, um, which was really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, like contra- been, contractors? Yeah, contractors. Yeah. A couple guys. Um, 
yeah, it's been super cool to sort of follow along. Cause like I never imagined, ever imagined I'd be doing something like this. And like watching, following along with guys that are like restoring buildings in downtown Albany, you know, downtown Albany, where we have like a lot of historic buildings there too. Um, it's like, oh, that, yeah, that's awesome. I know that building or like I know that street. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's wild. Albany is a pretty cool. I, I actually, everything in like upstate New York, that whole area from where you are, even north up through Albany is a really neat area with like a ton of history and i feel like it isn't quite gentrified yet um or you know not completely there so you can get these really cool old historic homes that at one point were kind of in their heyday top tier um and it, it's interesting because there will be a lot where it's like one's fixed up and then the one right next to it needs a ton of work um, but there's so many cool houses up there. Like I, I was talking to you kind of off air. My in-laws have a place up there. So we're always looking at real estate around there. And there's so many neat old houses that just don't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It would be so cool to be those type of projects. Yeah. Uh, like all throughout New York, like New York, <laughs> central, western, northern New York, you know, you go to like a small town in like Jay and near Whiteface and they'll be like, Six Victorian houses in a row, you know. The yeah. one had some money and built a nice house for themselves up there. And yeah, it, they're cheap. There's so many. Um so what is what is your business and company and structure look like now? Um obviously, you know, you're five years into it. What, what kind of what's the setup nowadays? So um in a nutshell, um I have Let's see, uh, four employees. Um, they're a mixture of full and part time. Um, I am still in the field pretty much every day. Um, we are doing, um, mostly like residential, um, remodeling and additions right now. Um, with, Kind of and a little more of an emphasis on like kitchens and bathrooms, um, but with some like millwork sprinkled in. Um, so yeah, um, we work um, thanks to you guys. We work cost plus, um, which was like a huge change for me. Um, you know, one of the big lessons in the last couple of years was like changing from fixed price to cost plus and yeah um i i at the five-year mark um it's been really interesting because i feel like i'm totally starting over not in the sense of like like i have clients now i have a following you know people know about us but like my systems and goals and i mean i had no goals starting mm -hmm. um and but now i have been spending a lot a lot a lot a lot I'm thinking about that stuff and trying to build some systems and, um, you know, make it so my team can have a little more ownership in the field um, so that my team feels like they're taken care of um, from stuff ranging like benefits to uh, opportunity to have employee reviews um, to, um having days where we set aside time to do like internal skills training, you know, and trying to like bring everyone up and figure out like, what are you interested in? Or like, all right, you want to like learn how to trim? Let's like do a day where we just trim stuff, you know, and like take a day, obviously get getting paid and like, let's focus on us. Um, so, you know, I've been, I have it right next to me on my desk, like all these, things that I've been working on, um, to reshape my business. Um, and I've been also thinking a lot about like, what do I want to do? Like I'm here. I know what kind of jobs we can handle. I have a sense of like what customers are looking for, but I'm interested in asking the harder question of like, what do I want to do now in the next five years? Um, like what about this job? This career that I've built is fulfilling, like what isn't, um, what makes money and what doesn't, when is that important and when is it not? Um, 
are you hiring people with um more experience than you at this point um kind of equal bringing in uh people who are kind of green more green so to speak or what's the company set up so it's right now it's basically equal or less um so my uh team who i want to do a shout out to because they're great and we've had a hard year and and i'm really thankful for them um so i have one guy that's been with me for four years um he's in his 50s ken um and he's great. I've learned a lot from him. Um, he was, when he started working for me, he was a stay at home dad that was re entering the workforce. He had been a lead for a builder for, say, like 11 years before that. Um, so for the last three and a half years ish, like it was just me and Ken and we did everything. Um, and we were like water, you know, like we had to do X, Y, and Z. We would like fill that gap and like worked it out you know and i mean like we built a brewery together we uh have done a ton of remodels a ton of like custom cabinets whatever so um he's uh more experienced um and then i have two other guys in the field um that are like equal or less experienced um both are part-time uh one um is a firefighter which is interesting you brought that up before nick so mm. he um applied for the job i want to say uh last winter and um was having a hard time finding someone who would employ him because his schedule is kind of erratic um he's 24 on 20 uh, 24 on 36 off yeah. something like that so every week it's the same, like he'll be off tomorrow. He's off Wednesday, following week will be Thursday. Then it'll be Monday, Friday, and then Tuesday. So I was like, you want to do this? You're interested in it. I don't care that you have to do your firefighter stuff. Like, let's do it. Um, right. And like, I think, and the newest guy that I brought on has been with us for maybe a month now. And his schedule is um, centered around, uh, taking his daughter to school in the morning. Um, and so I was like, I can be flexible. I mean, you're, you're a decent carpenter. You have a good attitude. Um, you get along with everyone. Like I have gone through a lot of people in the last year. And so I'm willing to be flexible if you're willing to like meet us, meet me halfway. Yeah. Um, and like commit to, if you like it here to sticking around and like, I'll make it worth your while. And, um, yeah. So it's See, a little, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool to be giving people that up, you know, the opportunity to do so. Cause I think so many people in business are so concerned with kind of hitting the production and wanting to wanting consistency and, and having a body there and being able to create an environment for people, especially hearing, you know, it's somebody like their priority in their life is getting their daughter to school and, right. n you know, not holding that against that person or, you know, that, that, that little girl's father where he's still able to sustain and hold a job and, and not make that affect their lives is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, like we all know how stressful it is to be an owner operator and I think it's easy to forget that it can be stressful to be an employee too. Um, and as an, as an employer, I want to make sure I'm thinking about my team. Um, and so, you know, like a friend says, another friend who's a contractor says like, we're not curing cancer, right? We're, we're builders. Like if I have a guy that needs a flexible schedule and, and, and he's able to, and put himself into the company and like make it worth my while. Yeah. No, no, there's no, um, like qualms for me there. It's an easy decision to make. I'll support that. Yeah. Um, and as a smaller, as a smaller employer, you know, like he's starting out part time, like I'm starting to figure out paid time off. Um, in addition to paid holidays, we do six paid, we do six paid holidays, right? The I'm trying to get building a business. Yeah, I'm trying to get that stuff together 
And, uh, you know, if a perk for you is me being flexible with your schedule, like that's an easy one for me. That doesn't cost me any money. Um, it's, so. it's the classic case of like, Hey, I'm finally understanding the work. And now it's like, now I have to devote time to the business. And it's like at that five year mark, and it's going to take you a couple of years where you're like, all right, I'm starting to understand this and things are starting to fall into place. And then you can begin to focus on the work again, but it's almost like you have to peel back um, to ensure that you're creating a sustainable and viable business and not just waking up every day and you know, getting your, your list of tasks completed and the, the work at hand done. There's, there's a lot more that goes into it, especially once you start hiring people. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I'm trying to think a lot about what I want to do too. Um, part of working in Newburgh, uh, has meant that like we have clients that have fairly limited budgets. Um, so like up until like last year we did our biggest job and it was like close to 400 K. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, it was like a seven month project building a wine bar in Beacon. And I mean, I'm thrilled with how it came out. We designed all of it, um, like collaborated with my friend who was the architect. Um, it was like some of our most complicated work to date. Like we made a. 24 foot built in with like a big arch door, like all on site, all finished on site. Um, and so like as a result of working with like smaller budgets, we do, and being cost plus, we do a ton of value engineering for clients on the front end of jobs. And it's gotten me thinking a lot about like what, it's got me thinking about like, how do I separate, separate myself from um, like what people need in a home versus like, what do they want just because it's fancy. Mm -hmm. And like, I know, I know that there are like a lot of families that struggle to like buy their first house. Right. And that they are often at a very limited budget point. They, all that they can afford is like the worst house on the block that needs probably the most work. So like they're buying into a massive, like, like a massive investment that they may not really want. Um, so I, I think what I want to try to do in the next couple of years is see if I can build a smaller, like sub 1200 square foot, uh, net zero, house that could be an affordable first house for a family um, while also getting to like put that creative background that I have like into play um, and like let the design be fulfilling and also let it have like a real impact on someone rather than like they have an ugly kitchen and they want a new kitchen. I'm not saying that that's not important. Um, I think like remodeling is really important and people deserve to have functional spaces that they love. Um, but I want to try to do something that like hits a little bit harder and maybe like serves people a little bit more um, while maybe uh, allowing like continuing to develop this like remodeling and, and building business that can run a little bit less without me Um if it needs to, while I focus on maybe, you know, maybe we bounce from remodeling to building a house, first house for a family, like a passive house, and then go back to some remodeling jobs. Um, it's interesting that you started kind of speaking to that because one of my questions that I have written down is like, how are you fulfilling that artistic need within you that kind of innate need to produce or you know like you said you wanted to become a teacher because you wanted to be able to make an impact on these people's lives and now you've foregone that at the time or kind of pushed that aside as you build your career and as you build this business and those those kind of innate needs that that a human being has that make you tick and make you who you are they don't necessarily go away just because you're not um 
participating in those acts. Uh, you know, they're they're not manifesting themselves through those actions anymore. But that that noise in the background doesn't go away. Um, and I was curious what you're doing to kind of quell that noise while you're building your business and while you're focusing on the work and you can't necessarily express that artistic side of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of it is, is having a painting studio and continuing to paint, um, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and you know, I think I've definitely been doing some soul searching, um, at this point and knowing like what my capabilities are and like how I feel, like, what are my feelings about like the state of building uh, in the, it's a, that's a broad way of putting it. Um, I guess there's uh, some reaction to in remodeling where like we spend a lot of time like cleaning tile, right. In like bathrooms that we've installed and like making sure the grout joints are nice. And like, we spend a lot of time caring about, uh, about uh, like material and finishes and making sure we're delivering them like in the best way that we can and that like we're just putting a lot of care into other people's houses and, and, um, and that's, and that's great and that's okay. Um, but I, you know, was thinking like, can I put that amount of care into something that doesn't exist for someone yet, which is like maybe a house that helps them offset their utility bills for the next 30 years. Right. Um, rather than like buying a 1920s craftsman that has a boiler from 1990 and insulation from 1970 um, and like a crappy foundation, you know, and like they're starting from like less than zero uh, as far as like a house that will serve them. Um, and I think, you know, and I hope it, this is all an idea so far. But I think that there's some fulfillment in there, too, knowing that, like, we're building something that someone will, like, really treasure because it's beautiful. It was designed in a thoughtful way. It serves their needs. And it might be a, a better house than 80 percent of the housing stock that's out there. Yeah, that's, that's a unique angle to take. <clears throat> and I'm kind of thinking as you're going through that and. You know, I'm in an older house and I don't have the, the means or the time to gut the, gut the whole house and kind of bring it up to today's standard. And I'm and that's able... A, and that's a minimum standard, too. <clears throat> Correct. Right. And also, like, I'm able to do that at a highly reduced rate, being that I would control a lot of the labor aspect of that. And then you think of somebody else who kind of takes on the the same task of doing that with an older house and for years everyone has been able to do that they'll buy a house and they remodel it one room at a time but with with the the cost of everything today and how how expensive energy is and what it just takes to kind of keep your house up and running like is that sustainable for a lot of people they now have to buy a house that's extremely overpriced interest rates are going up and they don't you know, they don't have the means to be able to renovate that house entirely at once. And so they're doing a single room renovation and you, you can't make that a cohesive, you know, singular environment within that house that's really controllable and managing air, air comfort, um, and utilities and everything else. And it's like, is that the best, the best way to be doing things nowadays? Like to, to take the, approach that we've kind of had for the past 60 years where it's buy an old house and renovate it as you can are there better options out there than doing that with the the kind of the increased cost of everything nowadays like it's not it's not the most viable option for everyone yeah i mean i would say most people you know in my city 80 percent of the occupants are renters right um and like having lived in New York City, I probably lived in apartments that were prob probably nicer than what's what most of Newburgh is like. Um, and I mean, the thought of like being able to build an affordable house for someone who could like not have to rent again. Mm. 
and maybe be in a house where like they're getting a little kickback from the from the grid, you know, because they are contributing like solar back into it or there and not to like there's so many complexities to that too where you know we talk about just the fact or the the capacity to renovate and if someone can't renovate an old home but it's also what you just said not to not have to rent often like rent is obviously there there's the financial side of it but also the ease of of renting mm-hmm. you just you sign a lease if you sign a lease and you pay rent and that's it yeah, where it's the, that's the other side of it is you if you were able to create this package home where it's it is thoughtfully designed, because my thoughts on that is I've been on some of these Habitat for Humanity projects. I've seen some of the and, and it's a great I'm not bashing Habitat for Humanity by any means, but sometimes they're not designed that well. Right. And sometimes they're designed actually pretty poorly because they're trying to make them look nicer because they don't want them to be out of place. Where it's mm-hmm. like just you're you're now you're complicating the system on the home, you're 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 at, you're adding increase to failure of you know the house isn't going to be you know isn't going to last a long time. So to your point, like thoughtfully designed means so many things there, but also just like being able to hand it over and say, hey, this is all you got to do. You just got to pay this amount every month, and this house is yours. Yeah, and I yeah. think that, I think uh, it's something that we've talked about before and and what uh, one of the things i loved about bensonwood is that they build these amazing custom timber homes around the whole country but then they have um unity homes which basically is taking the technology from all of their custom homes and finding a way to streamline that into a package Mm -hmm. and they're still like they're not they're not inexpensive but they're not as expensive as building a custom home and that's the same thing here. It's like you're whatever you're learning and whatever you're, you're from a design and build, it's being able to offer, being able to offer a twelve to fifteen hundred square foot starter home for someone, you know, where they can get in and they're they're in a good home like that. There's a huge market for that, and we, we keep skipping over it because the three thousand, forty five hundred, fifty five, sixty, ten thousand square foot home is cooler. Yeah, I, I, I agree and. You know, I, I, um, I've gotten to travel a lot and have always been really interested in, um, countries where space is more limited, like Japan, um, where people do more with less space. Um, and I know that's not for everyone, but it, it also is something I think that would be a fun challenge in like designing a 1200 square foot house for, um, like a family with one kid. Um, right. Like you got to be flexible. You do need a certain amount of space. Um, but if you're willing to stretch your imagination and, and the, and the person that wants to live there is interested in being part of that, then you could do a lot of really cool things. Um, I mean, to be totally honest, listening to your, uh, podcast when you guys went to Switzerland, um, mm. and toured the Sega factory, like, and, and we're talking about panelization. I had, like, I remember I was installing this kitchen in Newburgh for this big job we're wrapping up. And I was like, man, like, I stopped what I was doing to, like, listen to it. That and the training aspect of that, that episode. Um, and I was like, you know, we could do things so differently. And, and it made me, initially had the thought in my head of like, well, I'm going to, this would get blowback from like all the people who were saying like, Oh, you're taking like the hand out of it. But like, because you're not stick framing a wall or something. No, but because like, you're putting the guy in a shop instead of the field. Yeah. And like, and, and we could panelize in the field if we wanted to, there's like so many different ways about like doing something well, um, okay. that is still craft. Um, like it's still like caring is still craft, even if it isn't like a highly decorative end result. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think too, with the thoughtfully designed aspect, I'm thinking about like both the, the structure and the systems of the house, but also like working with simpler, less expensive material. Um, and you know, that can go a long way too. Um, so it's something I'm 
starting to get my like brain going on. Yeah, I think and, that, that that comes down to you now building for others rather than necessarily for your your own self um or your own ego, which obviously there's a ton of satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from that. And then you just have to sort out from a business perspective how to sustain and be a profitable business while doing so. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> They're big, big questions. Um, but that's what I'm. Yeah, I mean, where I'm now, at, you, kind of. now you have these these new and unique challenges where how can we build to the level that we want to build while kind of hitting this budget number um, and scaling back on things. And I think that now, you know, it, it's just, it's a shift of your energy and a shift of your focus where it's not necessarily on, hey, we're going to spend all of this budget on perfectly clean tile and grout joints. And how are we going to implement that time and those labor hours into different areas of the job where maybe this family gets a higher return on their money? Um, <clears throat> so I think it's, it's kind of shifting your your client base as well. One other thing that I wanted to ask you about, you had noted that you started a, a local kind of owner's group lunch with some local contractors oh, yeah. that you've been doing that I just, I, I want to hear a little bit about that. Uh, so mm -hmm. I um, was like, this is like through the summer, I guess, feeling like pretty burned out and pretty overwhelmed. Um, we've been having... Um, like a lot of people, I imagine, like subcontractor issues and scheduling issues and, you know, jobs kind of like that were supposed to be spaced out, like on being on top of each other and too much to do and not enough time. And um, and I was like, I can't be the only one feeling this way. Um, and I interact a lot like with people on Instagram like a DM with a lot of people and like, that's been a super rewarding um, part of social media. And so I was like, well, like, why am I not doing this with real people like in my town? So I sent a, um, started like a group chat on Instagram with about 10 people, um, like all who I knew um, either like we were, we were more or less acquainted, you know, sort of a mix and uh, certainly not everyone else knew each other. And we got together the first time at a diner. And we, I was like, in an effort to prioritize like this being important, we're going to schedule it like on a Thursday at 1230. Um, I don't want anyone to go back to work after. Uh, so like 12 to 3, right? Like for separation from the job site a little bit. And like, some like forced emphasis on getting together with like your local community kind of, and focusing on like interacting with each other. Um, so we've done two so far. Um, the last one we had like 12 people. Um, and you know, mostly it's mostly like local GCs, but we've got a couple of like, uh, owners from two custom cabinet shops that work near us. Um, they came, uh, uh, an owner of a painting company, um, and, you know, it was like, like, obviously, a like a little awkward at first. Not everyone, like, everyone was really into the idea, but we, none of us were really so sure how it was going to go and what it would be like. Um, but it's kind of been like a really laid back, like, group therapy in a way. Group therapy BS session. Um, and, you know, it sort of starts out as... Uh, like I try to give it a little structure and like, you know, if we have new people, I'll make everyone kind of like introduce themselves again. And, um, and then like, you know, ask anyone if there's anything they want to like talk about specifically or anything that they're like struggling with or, um, and, you know, so like we've talked about stuff like, how do you, how are you like training your employees? Um, do you give, you know, employees like specific job titles and roles like do you you know like in union construction like there's a foreman and the shop steward like do anyone does anyone take that kind of structure to their company you know um what are you using for your like 
um, project management software, like all those kind of things get brought up. And then the group usually splits off and people talk in their own groups and then we come back together. And I mean, so far it's been awesome. Uh, That's cool. And everyone finds, I'm sure everyone finds that like very valuable for themselves for many reasons. Like one being able to kind of dip out of work and have that where it's like, Hey, I'm not going back to work. I'm just, I'm going to devote my time to this. I'm going to be present here. I'm not going to worry about what I have to do. Um, but then having that, that network where like, yeah, you, especially the past two years, the network of your peers has been so digital and so remote and being able to do that with a lot of people who are local and not have it be competition, um, and rather be helping everyone else, um, kind of progress and, and that whole rising tide, um, really has to be refreshing for everyone. I think so. I hope so. Um, the feedback has been pr pretty positive and like other people have brought, you know, um, people that they know into the group and, um, yeah, I think we're looking forward to get our November one scheduled. Um, yeah, it's cool. Cause I think that, I don't know, it, so many times local contractors, you know, it, it's, everyone thinks it's competition, right? And, right at the end of the day, it's so much of what we talk about where it's like, you, you shouldn't be taking every job. You should be finding a job that kind of fits your criteria and maximizes not only your profit profitability, but just the format and the structure of your business. And I think that if you, you develop a, a local network of contractors, designers, vendors, subs that all understand who they are and kind of where they shine, that, when these projects come across, it's like, hey, listen, I'm not your guy for this, but I know so and so who really will do a good job. Um, and being able to recommend somebody. And then I think that, you know, that ends up coming back around to you where the lead comes across their plate and they can pass that back to you. And I think at the end of the day, everything works out to be the same just with like a better fit of contractor for everyone because all the same leads are still there and they're going to the same group of people, mm -hmm. but they're just, they're finding a better match for everyone. And then everyone's not competing with each other. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I mean, that, that would be the hope, right? Um, yeah. Cause like, instead it's like you drive by someone's truck and you're like, who is that guy? Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, what is he doing here? His, his area code is wrong, you know, or whatever. But like uh, now, you know, you've met with these people and you have this kind of group that gets together and now you're driving by that truck and it's like, Hey, that's so-and-so I can stop and say, Hey to them. And they could be like, Hey, you know, uh, I just had a, a, a customer call me who's looking for this to get done. We're busy. It's not up my alley. Like, would you be interested in it? I can refer them to you. And again, I, I maybe it probably would drum up more work than just kind of staying in your own little world. A hundred percent. Yeah. I just had this conversation the other day with a builder. Uh, we get lunch every once in a while and I, and I actually texted him. I said, Hey, you know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about the fact that you're doing projects that you don't want to do that I want and I'm taking on jobs that I don't want to do that I know you want. Yeah. So let's just like map this out. So when these come in, let's just shuffle them back and forth. We've even talked like, about that in like an employee sense too. I mean, it's nothing really concrete, but like struggle, yeah. we've struggled a lot to get to find good help. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went through five people this summer um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, and I like floated the idea. I was like, what if you like had someone that you worked with you, you know, that was great. And like, you only needed them two days a week. I'm like, I could probably fill their schedule the other day. Yeah. They're already working as a 1099. Like, sure. what's the difference, you know? Or, and Or even as far as, and this has happened with me, is like I've had some guys that they just weren't a good fit here or we weren't a good fit for them. And then, you know, someone I know gets a call and they're like, hey, you know, what's up with so-and-so? They just applied with, for me. And I give them the rundown. I'm like, hey, listen, like, great carpenter. You know, we didn't have the right structure in place for them or, you know, they weren't the right fit for these reasons, but would be a great employee for you. Like at the end of the day, it, like just because they don't work out here doesn't mean that they're a bad employee or exactly. a bad person. Yeah. You know, a lot of times it has to do with our, it's like the way our business is structured. 
And I know that th- this guy calling me has a different structure and, and probably has a better path for that, that kid's success. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. Yeah, I agree. Um, can I like change the format a little bit and ask you guys a question? Sure. Go for it. Uh, so I know both of you guys tend to work with, um, like a higher budget, uh, Client base, often like more expensive, more detailed, um, like especially Nick, some of the stuff that you guys get into, um, super detailed builds, um, with very expensive materials. I'm would love to hear what your thoughts are on like having a, a career that, uh, is centered a lot around, um, like what's a very like consumerist part of life, right? Is like how much people spend on like making their homes nice looking. Um, it's something I think and about a lot and struggle sometimes with. Like I'm spending 200 hours putting in $50 a square foot tile in a shower for mm-hmm. someone. And like aside from beyond the actual, you know, use of taking a shower and having it be a waterproof clean space. Um, the rest is just for looks. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I like sometimes get hung up on that a little bit and wonder and, and think about it. I'm so curious to hear your guys' perspectives on, on that aspect of being a builder, um, in general. I mean, for, for me personally, I don't, I think that we do, I do a decent job of um, kind of managing the budget where it's not going too heavily towards materials or labor. And I think that I like to match whatever, whatever finishes we're using. Um, I want to be able to install them the best way that I possibly can just for longevity. So, um, I don't really think of it as like, I don't want to be doing something that's just doing it for charging the customer and kind of maximizing what we're able to make. And like you said, from, from a consumer, uh, consumerism perspective where it's like, Hey, sell as much as you can, as high as you can. And the, the most expensive install and the most expensive materials, I want to be able to, even if it is expensive, really provides some sort of value to them as far as like they're getting their money's worth here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't want to feel as though they're just throwing money away because it's like, Hey, this looks really cool. Um, so I think my peace of mind there is that regardless of the material that we're using, we're implementing methods that are kind of long lasting and yeah, like maybe we use a less expensive material or maybe we use a more expensive material and we kind of work around that budget from the get go. Um, I guess, I guess I'm sort of asking more from a perspective of like a client approaches you and says like, you know, Hey, my, um, budget is X and, um, but I like really, really want like, you know, like, three inch thick solid marble counters or I want a sink that doesn't have a drain in it. You know, when you start to get into a level of like where, you, where, where uh, want exceeds need need, um, and, and, and are it's you, expressed in like an expensive material way or an expensive craftsmanship way. Just so, cause I can, I feel like I can answer this two, di- two ways, but to further clarify what you just said, are you kind of going along the lines of when their budget is X and they're asking for something really expensive and by asking for that, they're looking to sacrifice. Oh, no, else? I mean, that's like, okay, we'll adjust scope and we will try and make that work out. So are, are you strictly just saying the lifestyle of, of spending for nicer or more luxurious things that are unnecessary? Yeah. And like, how does, how do you guys feel about a, like being in a, being in a, in a business and a career that like somewhat supports that kind of 
mentality, I guess. Sure. Um, and like, how do you feel about it? I, I understand what you're asking. And for me, I, I mean, I, I do like nice things. I do like, you know, we're designing a renovation on our house. I keep talking about it. I'm going to keep talking about it until I do it. And that's going to hopefully force me to do it. But it's not designed to be simple. You know, there's expensive elements to it, you know, where I want to use nice materials and I want it. It's more about the experience for me where it's like, you know, yeah, I could experience, uh, you know, we're, we're, I could experience the space with different materials, like the same way, but it's more about like holistically, like what I want and, and what those things bring to me or bring to the experience and the the overall aesthetic of it. And yes, there will be things that I spend more money on because I like them. Um, where I could flip the script and say, you know, up in our place in New Hampshire, that's a very different lifestyle. Like that's not designed to be overly refined and 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 sleek it's more simplistic and it, you know simple by nature and, and simple and, and and minimal in material and there's a beauty to that as well i i can understand and i and i can appreciate where you're coming from in the sense like sometimes you get hung up in it hung up on it and i go through the same thing and i'm going to make the relationship to like vehicles for example you know, I have a nice truck. It's, you know, it's a Denali truck, like just to say, right? And when I went to get a new truck the, uh, this past year, I was like, I don't need that. Why am I spending, you know, X percent more on that brand of truck when I could just go out and buy a normal white pickup truck? Totally. Like mm -hmm. complete, I could completely get a normal white pickup truck and I don't need something that expensive or that quote unquote nice. But at the end of the day, it's because I want it. And, you know, and maybe I justify it by saying I work really hard and I deserve to drive a nice truck. It doesn't, but none of that really matters. What, what matters is the fact that that's just what I want. It doesn't make me happier. I don't feel more powerful because I, I, I have a nicer truck. It's just at the end of the day, that's the truck I want wanted, and I think that yeah, there there has like there is that balance between it, and I think that sometimes you know we can sway really hard in one direction, you know whether it's super fancy and I'm driving a white G wagon to the job site, or you know I'm driving a, a you know a 1988 Toyota Tacoma to the job site like. Because I, I'm, I own it cash, and it, it it's got three hundred twenty thousand miles on. I mean, at the end of the day, it's. I, I think it's just. I don't want to say personal preference, but it comes down to like what truly you want, mm -hmm. and you know when it relates to projects and, you know, building and architecture. Yes, there's, we we don't we've never worked with a client with an unlimited budget, and there's always a value engineering um, degree that goes into the process. And yes, we work with some clients that spend a, a, an exorbitant amount of money on a bathroom and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's like, but they still had a budget and they still, you know, had a cap as to where they would stop that spending. But there were things in there that drove up that price that they wanted. Did they need them? No, but they wanted them. And for me, it's, you know, if I can deliver the experience throughout the process at a high level and then deliver a product that they get to experience and really enjoy, then that's, that's what matters to me. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it comes down to, I don't want to perpetuate, um, kind of the, the societal impact of just like more, 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 or kind of, um, wasting a ton of material or using a a product that is really harmful to the environment just because somebody wants it in their house. And I think that at the end of the day, my projects obviously come down to budget, but they also come down to the customer. And I think that I want to work for people who I like as individuals. Um, and, I, you know, if I feel like it's a job where I'm kind of contributing to 
that mindset um, and that kind of social status that you're saying, I don't think that I would take that job. So I don't, I don't feel as though I'm in that position. I would, we just said on the last podcast, like I would love to be able to work for people who are less fortunate and less privileged, but I also have a lifestyle and two kids that, that at this point in my life does not allow me to live the lifestyle that I want by doing those projects. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's like I have the golden handcuffs on. Um, <clears throat> I think that if I really wanted to be doing a different type of work or working for people who weren't so concerned with the, the material items in life that I'd be able to make a switch, but I want to be working for nice people and I want to be doing quality work. And that kind of puts me in the, the target customer and uh, where I am right now. Um, but I, I also don't feel as though I'm working for people who are just um, kind of spending for the sake of spending and, and, and using um, materials that are really harmful to the environment and just kind of wasting so it's uh I think it comes down to what you want to be doing in your life and how you you know what what fulfills you as a person if that doesn't if working for those people and charging that amount of money and spending countless hours on on cleaning tile like you said is not providing you the fulfillment that you want in life it's like you need to make a change and find out what is because like maybe that at some point did and it's not anymore and, you know, f t kind of going down this road of being able to provide a, a product to a family that's going to get a much higher return on their investment, if that's what's going to get you up every day and get you excited to be in this industry, then, like, that's just what you need to do. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, it's a... I don't think there's a kind of one size fits all or a right or wrong there. For sure. um, I think it's just trying to figure out where you want to be and how you need to get there. Yeah. And that's tough. Yeah. It's, it's super interesting. And I love like being able to get the variety of perspectives. Like I was listening to the last podcast episode this morning and Nick, you were talking about the client wanting to put in that gaslight. Mm. And I was like, like it just blows my mind to like, like there's such a scale within building um, that of like what's achievable um, if you're willing to spend the money uh, and to like make it happen. And I, like, I have a lot of respect for building at that level and with that level of detail and being able to say like, you want a gaslight? Yeah, we can do it. Mm. Um, I'm like, that's awesome. It really, it really is. Um, and it's, cool that both like realities are possible you know yeah and i mean uh, just because that's that's awesome and that's great to one person doesn't mean that like that's what keeps everyone waking up and putting their boots on in the morning um yeah I, yeah you know like that they, i know that there's a ton of people who progress in their career and they they don't want to be doing that like they want something that's more rewarding for them um and i think that's just an evolution of yourself and kind of finding out where you're meant to be and where you're, where you're meant to be last year may not be where you want to be this year. And it's just always adapting and kind of changing. Um, you know, I think that I chased a specific customer for a long time, whether it was ego driven or financially driven. And it like, <clears throat> when I look back at it, like, like you were saying earlier, when I look back at it and I look back at the year and I look back at the customers and the headache and the strife and everything else, I'm like, did that really make me happy? Is that really what I want to be doing? Like I did some cool projects, but that like every single day that, that didn't make me who I am that I don't want that to define me as, as a person, you know, when I'm laying on my deathbed that like, well, he did it. He did a really cool gym renovation for someone. Um, <laughs> So like I, I try and find um, more satisfaction with the relationships in my jobs um, with the, you know, being able to help and provide for subcontractors and create like a, a good environment for them where they can be profitable and kind of highlight what, what their talents are 
um, and just find customers who just value what we do. And I think that that's kind of what makes me wake up every day and lace the boots up more so than what the budget allows me to do with that. So hopefully that somewhat answers your question. In a, yeah, in a I think so. Long winded roundabout way. <laughs> I think there's a, it's so interesting to think about, right? That like through building and architecture, like they don't want to use the word lightly, but like, Transcendent experiences in spaces can happen on a really small, modest level and on a really big level um, that costs a lot more. I mean, I don't know if either of you have seen the Taj Mahal. Um, I never thought I'd really, I was like, oh, I've seen the photos, you know, I don't really need to see it. Um, but I got the opportunity to visit it and like, it's mind blowing. It's, it's like one of the wonders of the world now. Yeah. Um and, you know, seeing that on a massive scale, I mean, it's humongous. Um, but being all going from that and also being able to appreciate like, you know, the, the cottage that my parents have in the Adirondacks, right? That's like 800 square feet and being able to like appreciate like it's really simple and it's serene and like there's as much like, wonder and like um possibility for reflection and like and like enjoyment in both of those spaces yeah and they're drastically different scales built by people with drastically different skill sets and um it's you know i i think it's cool to be able to strive for that um like experience at the end of the day um that gets someone to like think or feel in a way it brings back the art conversation of like when you're in front of like a painting that really moves you, it's hard to describe like what, why or what it's doing, but like what we do can give the people those experiences too. Um, and I think it's easy to forget that, uh, especially like uh, being like enmeshed in the day to day blog and like what am i getting done have i sent a bill write my plumber a check you know i have to get this inspected or whatever you know yeah um, it's funny because i think a lot of those decisions and the drivers for them are people thinking that something's going to make them happy and you know that's not necessarily the case like a lot of times people build something where it's like once we get in this house we're going to be happy or once we renovate this kitchen we're going to be happy and it's not the case like you take an unhappy person they're going to be unhappy in the taj mahal they're going to be unhappy in the cabin mm -hmm. um so i think that ensuring you know that whatever your customers needs are and their wants that they kind of align with what you want to be doing for work um is important you know because if you're if you're just looking to if you have a customer that's just looking to spend because they have whatever their program is for doing that, but they think that that's going to make them happy, like you're going to have a miserable customer at the end of the the day because you're going to finish that job and maybe it's a it's a it, it's a knockout, but they're not going to be any happier than they were when you first started. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, about like what. And like knowing like what are you doing for people and like like what what um what's our job and what's not our job like yeah our job isn't to make people happy um if what we do makes them happy that's good um but uh i mean i think that that's what a lot of us hope for right like where if you're a people pleaser and you're doing work like a lot of what's driving you to do what you're doing and taking it to the level you are isn't because you're like, Hey, this is extra hours I'm getting paid for. It's because like, it's making you happy. And a lot of times your customers do find happiness out of that. Like, you know, the, the, the fact that they worked really hard for many years to be able to afford an addition to fit their growing family. Like there, there's probably a lot of joy in that for them. Um, and I think that that would kind of be the hopes for all of us to be able to, to help fulfill, um, those people's lives while fulfilling your own.
John, I got one last question for you. Okay. Was this what you thought we'd talk about? Some of it. Uh, I love that we got really deep into the art thing. Me too. Um, I wasn't really expecting that. Um, yeah, it's been good. Um, I'm so interested to hear about your renovation on um, your house. Mm. I'm about to start one of my own. Um, I just bought a house last year, a foreclosure, 1200 square foot ranch. And uh, we're starting to like put all the pieces together and start framing next week. But I'd love to hear like your perspective on like what you guys are going to be doing and like how all of that, like how doing what you do every day for other people, how does that translate over to like your own house? Well, like I did Tyler, it. you just did a bunch of work too in your house what last year, right? Yeah. It's uh it's interesting because what I value for myself and kind of what my customers value and what I what I value doing as a job don't necessarily equate and that's hard for some people to understand. Like my needs and my wants are far more different than my needs like my personal and when it comes to my own house needs and wants are much different than like what I demand on my projects and what I want for my customers and kind of what they're coming to me for. So I think that Nick's probably what Nick does for his customers is, is more in line with what he's looking to do to his own house. But like for me, you know, I, my dream isn't to build something to the level that I build on an everyday. Um, I, I much prefer simpler kind of stripped down bare bones and uh i think that that's where nick and i probably differ yeah i would i would agree with that we are um we're gonna move out and basically approach it as though we don't own the home and renovate it as almost like a development um and basically buy it back um and i told my wife that there's a good there's a good chance that we won't be able to afford to buy it when we're done with it um, but obviously not the plan. I, no, I, I do. We, we renovated the first house and we made a lot of decisions that were based on like personal finances at the time or just like how to save money. And we made a lot of compromises that we just regretted. Sure. This one we want to approach as though like, let's do this right. Let's fully design it. Let's work with an architect. Let's flush out everything before we start and let's, you know, at least make the goal you know, the big, hairy, audacious goal, you know, and if we, if we get there, great. Um, if we don't, at least we, we were, we were charging towards that rather than, you know, kind of allowing it to evolve into something that just isn't cohesive with, you know, our brand. Cool. Sweet, man. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This has been great. Yeah, Thank for you. sure. Well, I have to, uh, We'll circle back once Nick gets going on his renovation and once you get going on things. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's going to be wild. We're ripping the roof off, putting a second story on, on the windows, building a shop. Amazing. I want, yeah. before we go, where can people find out more about your artwork? Uh, so they can go to my website. I have a website still. Uh, it's jonathanbeer.com. J O N A T H A N. Yeah. Beer B E E R. Standard Perfect. spelling. Yep. <laughs> Standard. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, good luck with the renovation. Uh appreciate your time. Good luck with work. You're five years in. I feel like you're uh you're coming to the the, the like precipice <laughs> of yeah, where like it, it should start to get easier. Yeah. Um I think I think you're at you're in the thick of it right now. Um, so you just got to keep pushing through. And I think that questioning what you're doing right now is a really good thing because you're at that, that pivotal point in your career where you could go one direction or another. Um, and you're fairly new into this, even though you're a little bit older and you want to be definitely heading in the direction that's going to make you bring you some long-term happiness. Um, so structuring things in a way that it's headed in that direction um, is definitely, it's, it's a good time to do it. Yeah. Awesome. Right, that man. was a, that was a good summary, Tyler. Oh, no problem. Don't worry about it.
<laughs> Pro. Dude, you're the closer. Pro. Yeah. All right, man. We'll appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Thanks. I'll talk to you guys soon. And yeah, for sure. And for some reason, that leave session button doesn't do anything. So all you got to do is X out. Gotcha. Oh, are you guys going to be at the Kukin Expo uh, on uh, Thursday? Unfortunately, I'm traveling not. for work, so I won't be. I was supposed to be, and then I like, I double booked. I'm an yeah. idiot, and uh, I didn't Same. realize. So, well, we'll I catch will. you at JLC or something. For sure, man. Cool. All right. Thank yeah. you. Take care, guys. See ya. Dude, I love the art side of that. Yeah, man. He yeah. uh, he doesn't seem like the the standard artist type. He's pretty um. Pretty clean cut, straightforward. I would like wouldn't peg him for a for a painter. When he started explaining in the beginning, I was like, "Oh, he gave it up," and it's like, "Oh no, no, no I still got work." And I was actually googling it. Uh, you could hear my keys tapping. I was going through his website, but uh, it's cool stuff, and it's it's super interesting. I don't. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check it out. What he said, it's Jonathan Beer. Um, I'm com, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure if you so Google add, that. Well, We'll add that to the the description. Yeah, but that was interesting. Um, I had no idea. Like, likewise, I mean, he filled out the form and was like, "Hey, I want to talk about my business," and you know, uh, five years in, and I'm like, "No, no, no, let's let's talk about that painting that you're that you just breezed over real quick." Yeah. So. Very cool. Um, sweet. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that one. Yeah. Um, Much different than I anticipated, um, which is typically we, the case. But we got a guest coming up um, in a couple weeks. Uh, it looks like we got Dwayne McEwen, DMAC Architecture in, and Interiors. Um, Tyler, it looks like you were talking. Trevor Tilston. Yes. yes. Correct. I feel like we've been emailing back and forth. He was a reschedule. Got it. And uh, so we'll get him on in a couple weeks. Uh, And until then, thanks to our sponsor, Rockwool. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.